Hi, my name is Bonnie Steinroder and I'm the pastor. And my name is John Moore and I'm the policeman. We want to welcome you tonight to our fourth episode of The Pastor and the Policeman. And for those of you that may have not tuned in before, what we've been doing, we've been working our way through a series of books on constitutional issues. And we're doing this so we can start a conversation in our town and beyond on our own rights, it's our Bill of Rights, so that all of us can understand exactly what those rights are and begin to talk with our neighbors about it. So in our past shows, we have touched upon the First Amendment with free speech, the Fourth Amendment with um, uh, surveillance, uh, the Fourteenth Amendment with gay rights, and tonight the Fifth Amendment with property rights. And we'll be talking specifically about the takings clause. And we're lucky enough to have a couple of special guests in our audience tonight. Catherine Pierce, who is the town assessor for the town of Holliston. She's been in that position for over 20 years, but she's been in the field for over 30. And Mary Greendale, the host of Just Thinking. So here we go. First clause I want to throw out is, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. And I think everybody's heard that before. Um, and the second part is, nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Now. If you pull out certain terms within those two clauses, a number of questions will come to light. Um, and, you know, let's go through them. Uh, does property include real estate, personal property, intellectual property, or just an interest in property? Um, what qualifies as notice and an opportunity to be heard under due process? How do you establish a private interest in property, and how is the world put on notice of that interest or ownership? What exactly qualifies as public use? And can public use be linked to private gain? And then lastly, what metrics are used for just compensation, and how can it be challenged? So with those questions in mind, jump in. Well, what I was going to jump in and say, um, first of all, I was going to back up to one thing, sure. which is that the reason that we're doing this show is it is our hope to start a conversation in Holliston and beyond about how these constitutional issues apply to our everyday life. And the reason I say that is because when I first read this book, and I'll just be honest, eminent domain is not something I have ever thought a lot about. I'm a minister, I live in a church parsonage, I'm not a homeowner or a landowner. And when I started to read the book, I'm like, why is this important? But as John and I started to go through some of the questions and we were chatting before with our guests, I realized that it is a really important issue because for me, at least, at the core, what we're talking about are the government rights versus individual rights. And in our country, in the United States, we have a very strong sense of personal rights, individual rights, personal property that our Bill of Rights gives to us, and yet we do have a government that we're a part of. So I think the backdrop about how limited should the government be, how, um, how much individual rights should we possess, those are really important issues, I think, that apply to all of us. And one of the ways I wanted to start the conversation, I wanted to turn to one of our guests, to Catherine. When we were chatting a little bit before, Catherine shared a story with me because we were talking about an imminent domain, the government's right to come in and to take someone's property for the greater good. So if you need a highway or a post office or there's a myriad of reasons that, that could happen. And Catherine told a story about her childhood in Natick that for me really brought into focus um, at least one side of those issues. So do you mind just telling everybody the story? Um, as a child, um uh, you know, and actually, I still do live in the same house. Um, my father had his practice in the home, so his, um, you know, how he earned his living was out of the home. And um, we faced the threat of eminent domain, having taken, uh, talking about taking the houses um, in our neighborhood for a roadway. Um, they ended up taking a house across the street. They ended up taking um, several homes kitty corner to our house, and they ended up taking about six feet of our of our property. But we lived in fear for a long time um, that our home would be taken, and my father's living would be diminished. 
Um, and, and it's a real thing in respect to that. Uh, and it was a relief when it was over, but it took a long time. It took a number of years for, to go through this process. And I realize as you're speaking, it's not too, you couldn't just say, okay, we're going to sell the house. No. Because who's going to buy the house Precisely. knowing that it could be taken at any moment? Precisely. And, and then as it, also where we were, it was a corner corner lot on a busy road and, and my father's business was you know had a sign out there and even though he had um, a variance to to do his practice there um, you know his his people knew where he was and it would have been more difficult to set up that kind of a variance in another place right right so, so it gives it a very human face absolutely. and when you look at the government point of view you don't always see that right right, right. Um, just, just to play off of that, um, let's talk a little bit about what eminent domain is not in terms of your government. Um, if you read through this book, and it's very interesting, it'll talk about two other things that a government can do um, that are not per se takings. One of them is exercising their police power. Right. And the police power doesn't mean that law enforcement officials come in and, and get involved. In fact, what it means is elected officials will take certain action based on laws and regulations to safeguard the public health and safety, which might be taking part of a property or altering a property or putting out an order that property owners need to change something mm -hmm. within their own domain. Um, the other thing is taxes, whether they be um, real estate taxes or estate taxes. These all affect property. Um, they're not takings. Um, it's part of our common society. Um, we all contribute to the tax base, and that's not a taking. Now, a taking is when you take someone's property for the collective good. Um, elected officials, and it's a, it's a political process, <clears throat> will decide that we need to take this um, portion or parcel of property for the public good. Um, now I wanted to throw it to our other guest, uh, Mary, and she might talk a little bit about what might have taken place many years ago in Holliston, but didn't. Are we talking about the airport? We are. <laughs> that we I are. just found out about tonight. Yeah, in 1972 there was a movement out of um, Boston, uh, an interest in expanding a jet port out here to relieve the congestion at Logan, because after years and years of struggles with the folks in uh, Winthrop and East Boston, uh, there was a there were it was just a constant battle with them. So there was an effort to come out here, and um, so they put out maps and had you know talking groups and all that kind of thing. And then there was a an opposition grew out of that. John Loesch, who was still here living in Holliston, uh, was the chair of that. Um, the issue for us, me personally, was that. It was going to be on the Holliston Hopkinton line. So if you were living under the footprint of where the airport was going to go, you were going to get some uh, benefit from it. You were going to get paid for your property. Now, one might debate how much you were paid and whether it was right. the right value and so forth. But you were going to get some compensation. But our house happened to be at the end of the runway. Right. <laughs> so, so we were going to get the buzz factor with no compensation. And so then the question becomes, is that or is that not something of a taking? I mean, you're seriously and grossly affecting that property, right. to say nothing of the people who are in it. But the value of that property seriously diminishes, and yet there really was no likelihood that we would have uh, been compensated. Right. 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 And what is a person, I mean, one of the <coughs> points that the author of this book, um, who's a libertarian, kept hitting over and over again, is that there really isn't a recourse, right? You can go to court, you can make your case, but if the court sides with the people doing the taking, that's it. You know, you have to surrender your property or let them put a runway in. Well, I would even talk about, as, as a director of, um, as an associate director for the Department of Housing and Community Development, the Bureau of Relocation was in my division. And that Bureau of Relocation was to make sure that all state agencies were following the laws in regard to taking properties. Mm -hmm. So any agency, transportation or health, whatever, could take property, but they had to follow the laws and the Bureau of Relocation was responsible for making sure that they did it appropriately. We ran into a case in Worcester where the Worcester Redevelopment 
um, group decided that a an oil company that the big oil tanks that their oil was stored in because it was they were attached to the ground that it was real estate and so it was all valued as real estate rather than personal property and basically crippled the business mm -hmm. because without having any value to them in particular they couldn't continue right. to function nor could they relocate and so they petitioned you know and, and they they appealed that and ultimately it came in front of our agency we found that the redevelopment authority was wrong but these poor people ended up having to go to court to prove it and it took like years and in the process the man who owned the business died from stress and heart issues and that kind of thing and basically the the business suffered severely right. so you know, it, it isn't just it isn't just the taking, and it is it it can be also all of the pieces that go into it, how the decisions are made, but the little guys got pretty much no recourse. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and that remind I was we were chatting a little bit before, and I was saying too, I saw a man interviewed just the other day who has a cattle ranch, I believe it is, along the Rio Grande, where if the wall um, that President Trump wants to build gets built, he would lose that property. And he was explaining that his family had lived there for generations, that he has livestock. Um, so even if the government were to pay him some compensation, nobody can compensate him for losing his family home. Where is he going to re? locate his livestock to and that issue comes in again some people if you're in favor of that wall might say well it's for the public good um, other people might say no there is no public interest in putting that up but either way right that man gets stuck in the middle and he really stands to lose everything and yet right there would be times mm -hmm. right where it's probably a necessary, right, we would have no roads, right? right. Like if we had right. never taken eminent domain, there would be no Route 9, and maybe that's a good thing. Right. We're not here to argue that, but, yeah. um, but, but there has to be a point where the government can do that. Right, I mean, you know, you and I had talked about this several days ago, and you would ask me from a legal perspective, where do you see most of the takings taking place? Right. Um, and I said from a personal standpoint, or professionally as a lawyer, um, many times it's a sidewalk. Um, not a lot of land, right. you had your state. but <laughs> a public use for the betterment of your society or community, taking people's or part of their front lawn for a sidewalk. Now, they're probably going to get the public use part, but whether or not just compensation right. is reached, that's to be determined. So I'd kind of like to throw it back to Catherine, yeah. who is a town assessor, and she talks about values all the time. I don't know if you've had any personal experience or professional experience where they've come to you and said, we're going to take this property. We need you to put a value on it. Mm -hmm. well, one of the things you have to do is you're looking at the market, and you're looking at market value, so you're looking at sales. Um, if it's a, a small piece of land, it can be difficult to prove what the, that excess land rate would be. Right. If that taking ends up changing the, the size of the lot overall, where it, it is no longer fitting the, um, the zoning, mm -hmm. that could create bigger problems. Um, you know, I, there, there's a phrase called grandfathering, where mm -hmm. you're protected under the, the previous bylaw if the bylaws change, but what happens when your your land changes and puts you below that zoned lot size, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so you have to look, kind of take into all kinds of considerations. And, and one of the things that I think about is that, you know, it's rights are important, but with rights there are obligations. Yes. Sure. There are obligations on both sides. Yes. So there's obligations, you know, if you have the right for that property bundles to own property, you also have the rights and you have the obligations of the law to support the community through taxes and so forth. Right. And, the, and the government has the right to take property, but they also have the obligation to make it right mm -hmm. and to make it fair. Um, and who makes that decision? Right. And, and when they don't come together, that's where they go to court in those court cases cost money and last a long time. So what happens in the, mean, in the meanwhile? Yeah. And that's kind of difficult. But market value is usually what we lay back on mm -hmm. for what's fair. Okay. 
So that's where you right. would go. Just to follow up on one point you made there about zoning. Yeah. All right. So zoning would be considered a regulatory taking, mm -hmm. um, in a sense. Um, say two new homeowners, you know, John and Mary Smith buy mm -hmm. a house. Typically, they're not going to read the zoning code, all right? But they might have plans for a pool in the back. They might have plans for a fence. And then they run into the issue of zoning. Um, and they might try to make an argument that it's actually taking my property, hmm. um, even though it's, that zoning regulation is in place. Or may, maybe it's a, an environmental regulation, and they're just not knowledgeable about it. Um, in the case of zoning, um, you know, if, if they weren't able to um, prove to a court that it was an actual taking, um, then their only recourse might be political, right? Um, oh, elect somebody yeah. to the zoning board that might feel the same way you do, and you'd get a variance, or maybe they'd work towards changing the zoning. Um, any, yeah. any comments on that? Well, or I Mary, you've had a lot I, I was going to say, Mary, Mary looks, looks like she has a comment. <laughs> um, I, I saw her face I starting to... <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, where I really see zoning coming into, you know, and this is another example personally, is that, you know, I found out that, like, very, I, I live very close to Route, Route 9 and, and the Natick Mall, and there's a very small section, a very small triangle of um, commercial buildings, and I found out that they made that the X-rated zone for zoning in okay. my town. Right. And I was very upset about that, and then one of my colleagues said to me, but that's the only place in town they're allowed to do it. And it was like class A commercial. So the, the chances of it actually going on, you know, um, may or may not ever happen in my lifetime. But if they don't create a zoning place for that, then typically this kind of business can happen anywhere in town. So you see um, in zoning where there are regulations that says, okay, you can do this, you have the right to do this, but you can only do it over here. Or you have the right to do that, but you can only do it here. And, or you have a zoning that says, you know, you've got 20,000 square feet, and that pool's not going to fit those setbacks, so you can ask for a variance. Right. There are, you know, there are exceptions to the rules. You have to go through the, the extra paperwork. Mm -hmm. But there are exceptions, and it's, you know, it, it you go back to your group of peers on your zoning boards and, and you make a proposal. A lot of these things are not impossible to, to ha get done. But they are, the, the regulations are put there for the general good, uh, to protect everyone. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. But then you might also get into, you get your variance, okay, and you have a lot of a certain size. And I'm in your same neighborhood, I have a lot of the same size and I don't get mine, and then someone will say, maybe it's an equal protection claim. Maybe I'm being treated differently mm -hmm. than you. That's true. Um, which can complicate the matter greatly. Absolutely. So, Mary? The one change that I'd like to, or amendment that I'd like to make is that the board, the zoning board's not elected. It's appointed by <coughs> the board of okay. selectmen. Oh. So as a result, it's a little bit harder to get to that, to mm -hmm. that three-person board and influence an opinion enough that it's really going to, to sway things. Right. So I, I didn't, it just, you know. It, and I also find that in town government, it, it's much, much harder than it is in, certainly in, in more urban settings, to be able to affect change um, or to affect an, an outcome. The place that I have found in my experience where you'll see a major effect for politics is at a state level or a federal level pro probably, but at a state level for sure, when it comes to things like economic development. So lots of times yes. there will be certain benefits provided to take General Electric going into Boston or whatever, and they will be given all kinds of tax incentives and other benefits. Well, the state's not allowed to provide any kind of public money right. to enrich a private entity, even a business. So the way it gets played is that the business has to guesstimate how much uh, revenue they're going to generate for the community and also how many jobs they're going to create. And in my years, I never saw one come even close. 
I, I mean, it's total cynic about it. And I had experience where it was just a directive, basically, yes, we are doing this one. Right. Numbers may not match, something may not, you know, but we're doing this one. Mm -hmm. So there are roles where politics come in, for sure. sure. Mm -hmm. Not sure that, you know, the local ZBA kind of place is where you're really going to see it as much. Right. I mean, if, if, if it did, it would be so drawn out that you would lose interest and... In you know, you change plans. Yeah, or um, move to Ashland. Right. Right. You move to Ashland. <laughs> right. Um, now, an interesting case that they cite many times in this book is the Kelso case. Um, like versus where New London? Was that, New yeah. London, Connecticut, where a young lady who was, I believe, a registered nurse bought a Victorian right. house, and it was, you know, what she always wanted. And she got caught up in a taking for public use, but it was for economic development. Right, and and part of that, right, and beautification, and right. they were trying to upgrade. The city had been um, through a depression, mm -hmm. and so they were really trying to spruce vitalize, everything up. Vitalize, vitalize that's right, the word. Right, and if you read through this, and you know, th this book is about 10 years old, but if you look for an update as to what happened on that property, um, she got compensated, which included moving her house right. off of that lot. Right. But last we checked, the lot is still vacant. Right. So what so they wound up was there. going to be a public use for the collective good hasn't taken place yet. And her case went to the U.S. Supreme Court in 2005. Right. Right. And kind of, you know, ta um, going along with that, it's a little bit different. And I do really want to hear what everybody has to think because think about this because again I'm really on the fence about it is um, he does talk about in the book about rent control I'll say when I moved to Cambridge to Central Square in 1980 my rent I had two roommates my rent was seventy dollars a month mm -hmm. including everything now granted we were above hi-fi pizza if you remember anyone remembers hi-fi pizza and it wasn't the best neighborhood in the <coughs> world back then but there was rent control throughout Cambridge throughout Somerville where people like myself who were young who had a very modest salary could afford to live in those towns <clears throat> excuse me and I was um, thinking about before when I, I lived in kind of a rough neighborhood um, back in the early 80s in Jamaica Plain and you know I would get off the subway and I literally would have a rock I would have um, you know I mean I was prepared I had a whistle that I would wear around my neck I was afraid right. to walk on right. the street at night to get back to my house and some nights I didn't go out unless I knew I could get a ride home. Now, for anyone that's familiar with Cambridge, Somerville, Jamaica Plain, you know, very few of us could actually afford to live there anymore. It's been gentrified, but I don't think people anymore have to have a rock and a whistle. So on the one hand, you could make the argument and say, the neighborhoods have improved, right? There's no rent control anymore. Um, so if you have modest means, you might not be able to live there, and that's not a positive thing. But on the other hand, I think by anyone's standards, those neighborhoods are safer. And I go back and forth on this because mm -hmm. in my heart, I feel like it's wrong. It's wrong to force people out. People should be able to have affordable housing, and I believe in that with all my heart and soul. And yet I also know what it was like to live there in that time. But maybe it's not an either or. Mm -hmm. I don't know. What do you think? There was one thing that um, he said in the book about in order for all of this individual rights to be truly fair, mm -hmm. then everybody has to be considered. Right. So it isn't just the beneficiary of the rent control apartment, but the next door neighbor or, or the, right. the person across the street or the builder who wants to come in and, and do the gentrification. And when I read that, it was like, this is like utopia. You're going to get everybody's approval, agreement, and so forth on what's right or what's wrong or, you know, that kind of thing. And that's not ever going to happen. Government's slow enough as it is. Clearly, right. we're not going to be, you know, having town meeting on every issue. And national town meetings would be fabulous. Yeah, that so, sounds like a lot of fun. <laughs> wouldn't right? that be a lot of fun? <laughs> but, but. I do think that the difference is that you, you have to have collaboration, and that's where the whole idea of having stakeholders at the table, right. that's where that whole kind of consensus building evolved, I believe, from trying to find how do you do the right thing right. at the same time as you allow development to take place and you don't become so punitive right. that you are casting judgments, basically, making hard, hard decisions about 
the quality of things. In other mm -hmm. words, keeping it tamped down, tamping down the quality so that it can remain affordable. Well, geez, that's kind of a judgment call as to whether right. it's you know good quality or bad quality. So I think that's it, it is all about consensus and coming together. Yes. Unfortunately, we're in a time in this world or in this country in which that's the least likely and least attractive method currently right. being used in government. Right. Right. Just not. Right, because ideally there should be able to be housing available for everybody, you know, safe, decent housing, and it shouldn't depend on that. Okay. Um, I'm going to mix it up a little bit, add something else that we found in this book, and maybe get an opinion from both you and from our guests. Um, usually when people buy, when a person buys a piece of property, um, they will think that they've bought their property from the land to the heavens. Um, I read that. <laughs> Also, if they buy a piece of property down by the beach, they figure that they have beach rights that go well into the ocean. Um, however, these rights that they think that they might have usually aren't the case in the end. Any comments on that? Well, as a minister, of course, I'm like, how can you own any part of the heavens, you know? <laughs> Doesn't that belong to I God? I set you up really good, I didn't know. I? And but we didn't even talk about no, that. No, we didn't, but you know, and how can you own the ocean? And when you were talking, I was like, the ocean, which changes every moment, right? Where the marine life is going to be different from second, like, how can anybody own those things? Yet people do own part of the beach and... You know, I grew up at the Jersey Shore where there were beach clubs. Do mm -hmm. you guys know what beach clubs, you know? And like everybody went to one and it was all the same, it was all Sandy Hook and right, it was all the same piece of shore, but one was called Ship Ahoy and one was called Edgewater and they owned that part of the beach and mm -hmm. the ocean. So if you, if your family belonged to Edgewater, mm -hmm. you better not climb over those rocks to the Ship Ahoy ocean, right? right. But really, who can own that? Well, that's an interesting point because um, the the state actually gives title rights right. to um, fish. Well, in this case, scallop growers and oyster growers mm -hmm. down in Wellfleet and out around mm -hmm. there, and that's how we got the whole that whole industry of oysters got started back in the late 90s. I was working at the Department of Agriculture, and and it was because we were granting them access to those. Well, the people who lived up in the houses that were above that land that was, you know, the tidal flats, were very upset, terribly upset, threateningly upset, that in the morning there would be these people out there with trucks parked right. and hoes and rakes and all kinds of paraphernalia and stuff as they were trying to farm their right. oyster beds. Right. So, you know, the state on the one hand is trying to do something to generate a new right. industry that to them was in the public good, but right. the folks that lived up above it and looked at it every day didn't agree. Yeah. Interesting. You, usually with, with water rights, especially on a beach, you'll own to the high tide mark. Um, in between the high tide mark and the low tide mark, anybody can walk. But most homeowners, especially the ones that live on the beach, right. try to prevent that. Um, and it, there's really nothing stopping someone going out there with a the chair and putting it down in between those two marks and staying ah. And you know, keep I'm moving glad back. Glad you told me that. Now keep I know. Moving back to the high, <laughs> high tide mark, and then leaving once high tide is there. Um, the other issue that comes up is, um, say you own a piece of property. Um, do you own, like, say, a lake or a pond that's on it? And right. does anyone have a right to fish in it? You know. Um, those become property rights also, and I'm sure if your property encompasses that, you know, body of water, you're going to try to prevent people from fishing in right. it. You're going to say that you own everything within it. Well, what's the answer in Holliston on Lake Winthrop? I uh, mean, if somebody owns I... the land on Lake, uh, you know, Lake Winthrop, yep. and he owns right up to the water, mm -hmm. I mean, can somebody come and fish on his property? Well, I or, would think only up to the, the water mark because so, there's not a high tide so and a low tide. So he could be three feet into the water? I, I would say yes. That, I would say yes, and I would say that the town, you know, if you qualify, you can get a fishing license. Yeah, my husband the money. used to fish in Lake Winthrop and you, with I mean, the kids when they were little. Yeah. Sure, if you go out, I mean, I think of it as people going out into the middle of right. it and fishing and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. I wasn't, uh, but I'm thinking now, Someone's, so I just grab yeah. a little fishing pole and I jog it. Yeah, but we, see, we don't, we don't have... 
tides. Right. We have a current through there, but we don't have tides. But I can stand in front of somebody's house. I would say yes. Three I think you should go try there, that tonight, the, Mary, and report back what fishing. happens. I'll let you know how that goes. <laughs> So the Commonwealth of Massachusetts has um, rights over great ponds. I'm not sure if it's a great pond. It is a great pond. But okay, so it the, is? Okay. so and and they do have one lot down there where they would have their access, and then there are other public access points. Mm -hmm. So you could always go there. It might be a little bit more difficult to just sort of wade along the you know over to Rolling Meadow or something like that, you know. And, and sometimes the Commonwealth will put a buffer area between mm -hmm. the the water and the actual where the the um, where the uh, deed will begin. Mm -hmm. I've seen that around Lake Hachichuit mm -hmm. and, and other big lakes like that. I haven't seen it here. Um, so there are ways to make it work, and and ultimately that would be you know the Commonwealth's problem. The the what is it? The DCR now they they're in charge of all that maintenance kind of thing. But in terms of of owning a piece of property and you know having rights over and even under. I mean, how many of us? have water pipes going through our property yeah. or sewer pipes, maybe not in Holliston, but you know, going underneath our homes and so forth. Um, and that happens. Those are easements that are right. in the deed and they're described. Mm -hmm. And they are for the greater good of somebody, either that owner or another owner. Um, I've seen septic plans where your neighbor's septic is on another lot. Mm -hmm. It's not on the lot that you own. So those are all pre-decided before you buy your home right and, and already and it should come up in any title search absolutely. And you should be alerted absolutely. to it um, in the book the author Richard Epstein um, talks about you now you said easements easements are essentially an allowed nuisance okay so I'm gonna give you an example all right so you have a house down the Cape and you have this alleyway that goes down to the beach mm -hmm. Okay, the people that are walking down there to enjoy the beach, they are considered a nuisance, but they are allowed. They are allowed. On the other hand, you can have a restrictive covenant, which is a nuisance that is not allowed. Um, so, difference between the two. But what happens in a situation, and I wasn't clear about this, so say you have a home and the government decides that um, they want to do fracking or something like that, and you say, I don't want you to do that because I don't want, you know, there may be, it may be for the, it's not really for the greater good, right? It's for a company to make money. Mm -hmm. And so what if I don't want them to do that on my property? Do you have to allow them? It's a good under question. Property. It's, it's under, under my property. property. Yeah. Mm. And because there have been cases about that, there have been plenty of cases about that, and yeah, the little guy loses, no surprise. Right. You know, but when you come to things like development rights, here in Holliston, the Highland Farm, we bought, we and the state together bought the development rights of that property oh, right. and pre preserved it, protected it as a farm mm -hmm. so it can never be used as anything except a farm. And in doing that, we prevented 140 acres going into subdivision. I was going to say, okay. you don't want more condos? <laughs> <laughs> no, we didn't then. I guess we don't now. So that was 1983 or 4, mm -hmm. you know. But there are those kinds of programs that are available for a community that specifically wants to set aside open space. It's just like our conservation easements. On We have about 3,000 acres. Not all of it is under conservation easement, but those easements are saying it can only be used as open space. So that, that's almost a negotiated taking. It is. Let's talk about just compensation. If we agree, yep. then you're going to sign off on a restrictive covenant. And the only time I've seen something similar to that is, um, and it's out of this state, but I know somebody that has a property on Long Island and the county came to them and said, you have a found farm property here. Um, we want a restrictive covenant so that you will never sell to a developer because people like the agricultural view. Mm. Um, mm. And so they'll pay a certain amount if you take that money and sign off on it. You can sell it to someone else, but they have to live there and they can't develop it. Well, the way the covenant here reads is the only buildings you can put on that property are, have to be farm related. Mm -hmm. So you can't put up 10 houses or three houses for your three brothers or something like that. <laughs> it has to be farm related. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
That's right. very interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, right, and you know, I think day to day we don't think a lot about these issues until mm -hmm. something happens like in your family, mm -hmm. right? And all of a sudden you're confronted, or it's your cattle ranch, or they're fracking under your property. And I think that's why it's so important for us. I have to admit, when I first looked at the book, I was like, okay, you know, this is a little, um, it's, it's a little intellectual, it's a little dry, but then as we started talking about it and I started thinking about it, I'm like, no, these are really important issues True. and the really important rights that we have. And, you know, Mary, and you're saying the little guy, mm -hmm. right, will lose. You think about the government, the state, they're gonna have a whole, um, you know, they're gonna have a whole group of lawyers mm -hmm. who I couldn't hire, maybe even one lawyer. Maybe just John, if he'd do it for free. <laughs> just call me, you just called me a cheap lawyer. And I didn't make any cracks about you walking around Rosalindale with a rock around your neck. So. But really, but who's going to be able to fight that, right? And so that's why it's so important for us to know what these rights are. Right. Any final yeah. thoughts from our, from our guests? Um, just reiterating that our rights are our rights, but there are obligations that go both ways. Mm -hmm. and, and that's I really like to, that you said that. Yeah, I think it's important to, to know that. Mary? I really have nothing to add, <laughs> but thank you. <laughs> well, I mean, along the lines of all the books and all the amendments that we've touched on so far, um, we're trying to do two things, start a conversation and also educate people on their rights because mm -hmm. these are their rights within right. the, the Bill of Rights. Um, Right, and I want to thank both of you so much for coming down to the studio tonight to be our expert guests. It really adds so much to the conversation, so thank you for that. Thank you very much. That's all we have for this week on this subject matter, but please join us the next time when we talk about racial equality in the United States. Thank you so much for joining us on The Pastor and the Policeman. <laughs>